As I mentioned before, the words that we have before us today from Numbers chapter 6 are very familiar words. Regularly at the end of Christian worship, we hear these verses 24 to 26 expressed and proclaimed to us the blessing from God. This blessing is known as the Arianic blessing or the priestly blessing. There's also another blessing which is commonly used, and it's called the apostolic blessing. And that blessing comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, which says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This blessing will be the blessing that we use at the end of service next week. Both blessings, you see, there's kind of three parts to each blessing. The apostolic blessing, which you see before you right now, you see the three people of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But they all have a different quality attached to them for each part of the blessing as well. And that's same for our blessing from Numbers chapter 6. As mentioned before at the beginning of the service, today is Holy Trinity Sunday. As the apostolic blessing specifically mentions the three persons of the Trinity, so also the Aaronic blessing of Numbers chapter 6 has a further connection to the Trinity. And that's what we're going to explore this morning a little bit more. Which says, verse 24, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. To understand the special connection to the Trinity here in this blessing, it is helpful for us to now look back at the history and see when God gave this to Moses and when he gave it to his people, the Israelites. Picture now with me the Israelites. They had just been freed from the, their slavery to Egypt. They're running away and they're caught at the Red Sea. They don't know what to do. God gives Moses the power to speak the words and the Red Sea is opened. They walk through on dry land. The sea then swallows up the ensuing Egyptian army. Now they're wandering through the desert and they're free. And the Lord then speaks to Moses on Mount Sinai. But while Moses is there with God, he's there too long, supposedly, for the Israelites. And remember what happened to the Israelites? They talked to Aaron. Aaron, Moses, we don't know if he's going to return. Give us somebody that we can worship. And so they cast all their gold, jewelry, and everything into the golden calf. And they start worshiping the golden calf and turn their backs on God. Moses then repents on behalf of the Israelites and God forgives them. Moses then goes up to the mountain again and this time God gives him the instructions on how to construct the tent of meeting and the tabernacle. As they're wandering through the desert, this is supposed to be the special place where God would dwell and where Moses would be able to meet with God and take all the commands from God and then instruct the Israelites. And while they're wandering in the desert, the Israelites were even able to see the cloud appear above the tent of meeting, which would say God's presence is here and was with them. It was with this tabernacle and this tent of meeting that now for the next 38 plus years, the Israelites would, would be wandering and recognizing God's presence. 13 months after the Israelites were freed from the Egyptians, they were supposed to take an accounting of all the people. They were supposed to take a census. So they took a census of all the tribes. And you can see that in the first six chapters of Numbers. The first five chapters, I should say, leading up to chapter six. And there you see all the Israelites that are there. And it's two million in number. That census had just taken place. And their long wandering in the desert, desert then had begun for the next 38 years. And it's at that moment that God then tells Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. 
It's quite amazing to me that each time the Lord saves his people, the grumbling and the complaining begin rather quickly. Maybe you caught that in my reconstruction of the history there of the Israelites there for those 40 years. God saves them from slavery. They get to the Red Sea and what happens? They whine to Moses and say, you brought us out to the desert to die. God physically appears in the cloud right in there with a tent of meeting. Appears there with Moses. Or he appears on the mountain with Moses and they feel he's gone too long. And what do they do? They craft and worship a golden calf and turn their backs on him. The Lord provides them with this wonderful substance, manna, food in the desert, which I don't know what all the options were, but this gave them more options and actually a nice, sweet, tasty bread type substance. And then quail that flew so low that they could just grab them with their hands and have meat to eat. But then they complain about this food, that they're getting sick of it. God continues to provide for them in the desert water from a rock, and so on, and so on. And in the midst of all of this, God gives them this special blessing. Why? They didn't deserve it. God should have been more anger-filled towards them than giving them this blessing. But hold on for a second. We're no different. God has provided us with victory after victory so that we can live in a free country. Yet how often do we complain about the leaders? God has blessed us with so many different options. We open up a fridge. Maybe it's not as full as that, but there's usually options. And we complain there's nothing to eat. Teenagers are especially agreeing with me right now. How often do we say that and complain? God has brought us through many different health issues, sicknesses. He steered us clear of terrible accidents. He's protected us from dangerous storms. And yet, it's not always enough, is it? And in the midst of all of this, Every week in church, we get to hear the words of God blessing us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you, what? Peace. That makes this such a greater blessing than at first glance, doesn't it? Our God is so gracious and so merciful in the midst of our complaining, in the midst of our wanting more and not being happy with what he's given us. He blesses us. The words of the Aaronic blessing so clearly present God as the God of free and faithful grace and that is why we so regularly use it and proclaim it today. In referring to himself, God here uses the special name that he has chosen for himself. And therefore, each letter of his name, of the word Lord, is capitalized. Maybe you've wondered that why it's like that in the Old Testament. Why Lord sometimes appears in all caps. It's because this is his special name, the name that he's given himself, his covenant name. Through this name, the Lord presents himself to us as the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. As such a compassionate and gracious God, the Lord reaches out to us to bless us. Because the word Lord is repeated three times, we also perceive it as a reference to the Trinity. Though we as creatures are limited in our ability to probe the depths of the Trinity, 
we can appreciate the truth that the triune God acts on our behalf. As each of the divine being carries out his work, the triune God reaches out to bless all those who believe in the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. All three of them are involved in our salvation. And in that sense, we are triply blessed by the triune God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The first phrase of this blessing refers especially to the work of God the Father, the first person of the Trinity. The blessing from the Father includes all aspects of our life. Wherever we look, we can see how the Lord blesses us through physical, material possessions that he gives us. Luther's explanation to the first article of the Apostles' Creed summarizes these blessings very concisely. Noting that the Lord gave me my body and soul, my eyes, my ears, and all my members, my mind and all my abilities. And he does that by richly and daily providing clothing and shoes, food and drink, property and home, land, cattle, spouse and children, and all I own. We need only to look about in our homes, don't we? Look at the food and the furniture, the children and the cars, the dishes and the dresses, the suits and the sofas and even the electricity that mysteriously is present in all of the wall sockets or the indoor plumbing where we can flush a toilet or have water running. Count the many ways in which the Lord blesses us with temporal gifts. Just as surely the Lord blesses us with talents and abilities, with mind, with hand, we can indeed make a living. With the same mind and hands, we can serve him. Further, our Heavenly Father blesses and keeps us as he answers our request when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. How often the Lord keeps us and prevents us from having problems and dangers overwhelm us. How zealously the Lord works to keep us from going to those places where all are tempted to sin. But he so often pulls us away from those situations. Yet on the other hand, how loving our Lord is when he allows tests to come into our lives for he promises that through those tests, he will also make a way of escape. And that he also will use those for the good of our life. For the good of those who love him. And ultimately, the richest way in which the Lord blesses us is that he keeps us faithful to the gospel to the end of our lives. It is also his blessing that he will deliver us from this present evil world into the perfection of his glory in heaven. All these blessings, the Lord gladly includes in the benediction, the Lord bless you and keep you. But then we look at the second phrase. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. This part of the blessing addresses that we are all sinful. You might not see it exactly right there, but you got to picture it. That we are all sinful. By birth, man is all in rebellion against God. The only hope for such rebels lies in the fact that God is gracious to us. How clearly we see God's love for us in the work of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. 
using Luther's explanation of the second article of the Apostles' Creed, we note that God is gracious to us in Jesus, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sin, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did, that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. That is God's grace. God's undeserved kindness to us. It is grace in Christ. For in Christ, God shows his love to us. A deep, profound love that loves us also when we deserve the least because of our sin. In God's love, he makes his face shine upon us. Just as the face of a proud new mother radiates love, so God the Father and God the Son looks at us. Covering all sins with the perfect redemption that Christ has purchased for us. All these blessings the Lord proudly includes in this benediction. The Lord make his, makes his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And then finally the third phrase. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Here we see the work of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, also known as the Holy Ghost. The phrase, turn his face toward you, indicates that the Lord gladly looks on each of us as individuals. By contrast, how sad it would be if God would turn his back on us, ignore us, and leave us to the lot that we deserve. But he doesn't. He looks at each and every one of us individually. How wonderful is the work of the Holy Spirit. He turns rebels into his children by leading them to faith in Christ Jesus. He makes the blind see by leading them to Christ, the light of the world. As the giver of life. He gives life to those who are dead in trespasses and sin. Every believer is a miracle of the Holy Spirit. It is he who has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the miracle of conversion, the Holy Spirit gives us peace. Because we know that through Christ, we are now at peace with God. We are reconciled to God. We also know that the certainty of faith, that as long as we are right with God through Christ, we will have. And that everything in our life will also work out right for us. The believer enjoys a peace that stands up in the fiercest trials. Yes, it stands up even in the face of death. What peace there is to know that whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Anchored in this faith, we can exclaim with St. Paul, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Angels even proclaimed that peace that first Christmas Eve. Peace on earth, goodwill to man. Jesus promised the peace from the Holy Spirit when he said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. 
you hear from me after every single sermon as your pastor or maybe through other pastors that you've heard as well, that you enjoy this peace after every sermon through the words and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. What marvelous blessings the Lord has showered on to every single believer. He has given them to you. He turns his face towards you and gives you peace. His divine power and love stand behind each word that he includes in the final part of the blessing. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. The name of God was indeed on the Israelites. For the name Israel means man of God. So too in this New Testament era, that name is also on all believers that claim the name Christian. Which really means that we are followers of Christ. Of such believers, the Lord gladly says, I will bless them. This promise makes the blessing far more than mere words or some hopeful wish. The Lord stands behind each word. As the triune God, he gladly grants these blessings to each and every one of us. To such a benediction, believers in all ages have gladly said, Amen, so be it. Amen, so be it, Lord God the Father, creator and preserver, bless and keep us. Amen, so be it, Lord Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord, make your face shine on us and be gracious to us. Amen, so be it, Lord Holy Spirit, sanctifier and counselor, turn your face toward us and give us peace. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. The Lord be with you. Amen.